Okay, hello everyone. Um, let me know if you can hear this by uh, raising a, a thumbs up in um, in Gattertown there. Uh, I should have started this in a in a different window, but um, okay. I guess I gotta um, get into the swing of things again too. Uh, so. Um, Good morning. Yeah, so um, we'll pick up where we left off uh, in the last lecture. Um, so uh, we ended chapter nine um, on on momentum and, and collisions, and so today we're gonna we're gonna start with chapter ten on um, fixed axis rotation. So that's any rotation, naturally, where the axis is fixed. Um, it's similar to what we've talked about before, which was uniform circular motion um, and non-uniform circular motion. So some of this will be, uh, um, will be familiar, um, but now it applies to uh, any kind of rotation of, a, um, of a, even an extended physical body around um, a, a fixed axis. So we're going to, uh, to look at some kinematic relations first, essentially looking at what we did in terms of kinematics um, in linear directions but now we're going to apply that to rotations um, so kinematics as a reminder that's whenever we're talking about just describing the motion um, and we're not talking about the reasons for why that motion happens so we're not talking about forces yet that's going to be dynamics and that's going to be for friday um, and then we're going to talk about uh, some uh, um, kinetic energy Consideration. So, how to describe kinetic energy of something that is rotating? As as you know, something that is that is rotating will will want to continue rotating. So, there's some kind of inertia there, um, which is similar to the inertia of something that is moving in a straight line that wants to continue moving in a straight line with the same kinetic energy. So, so kinetic energy and inertia um, are related here. Okay. Um, I see one of you asks in the chat, when is the final? I don't know when the final is. That will be scheduled later. Um, so uh, they will announce that as soon as it's decided, and I will let you know as soon as I know as well. So we're going to start with uh, circular motion. Um, so uh, as, as we have a, an object here that is rotating around this axis, and the axis here is coming out of the page and is the, the z-axis, um, this object is describing, oops, is describing a, um, a, an arc with a length s. There's a, a radial vector, a position vector r, and there's an angle theta that describes the, um, the, uh, the angle, right? Um, and those are related. So uh, if we have theta here in radians, um, that will be the the arc length divided by r. So in um, terms of uh, angular position, which is what we we're going to call the angle theta, the angle theta is the arc length divided by the radius. Arc length divided by the radius. And of course, theta is in units of well, it's going to be meters over meters, um, and that's in units of radians. That's the angle units that we're going to use here. So this is a, um, a, an expression in, in scalar quantities, or rather this is an expression in scalar quantities. Zeta is a scalar quantity. It doesn't have a direction to it. S is a scalar quantity. It's a length that doesn't have a direction to it and r is a scalar quantity that doesn't have a direction to it. What will be useful is to write this as a vector quantity, as a vector expression too. Not scarlet, scalar. Do we write scalar with e or a? I think it's with a. Um, so we can also write this as a vector quantity, vector expression. And in this case, we're going to write this as um, slightly differently, that S, the arc length vector, is theta, a vector theta cross R. Now, um, we have to think about what S means here. S is going to be the tangential um, position vector um, 
r is the radial vector in this direction. And so for theta uh, cross r to be equal to s, that means that theta will have to be perpendicular to the page. I think we've got a drawing of that here. So um, now we have our theta vector that's along the z-axis that is out of the page in the previous um, in the previous figure. So that's coming out of the page here. Um, we have our r vector and we have our s vector that is um, theta cross r. So it's the the, cr the vector product, the cross product of theta and r. So it's perpendicular to both r and to theta. It's actually perpendicular to the plane um, described by theta and r. Now, why do we do this? It, it will turn out that that's a more, um, more fundamental way of describing this um, because it allows us to, uh, um, to pick this, this vector theta along the axis of rotation. And at some point, of course, we will have non-fixed axis rotation. Um, and then that will be a vector that will change, that will um, move in, uh, in space as the instantaneous axis of rotation um, of an object. But that's for, that's for a future course if, if, we, uh, if you take um, physics as a, as a major, or maybe, uh, maybe mechanics as well, uh, mechanical engineering. Now, the thing that's important here is um, the direction of this theta vector. So you can see in this case, the theta vector is chosen along the z direction, in the same direction as the z axis. And that corresponds, if we use our, our right hand rule um, for our, our cross product, theta cross r will have to be in this direction, so moving from x to y. Uh, oops, if we go to the previous slide, slide, theta out of the page along the z direction cross r will be, will give us an s vector that is moving from x, from x to r. So it's going in, uh, in the positive direction of angles here. And that's really the, the definition of the direction of theta. Um, it is a vector that in this case is, is out of the page and it's pointing such that um, the, the positive angles correspond with a right-hand rule. And one, one way to, to look at that as well, I don't know if I have that here, yes, here, is that um, if we look at the positive direction of the angle, that will correspond with an angle vector theta that is pointing along your thumb, right? So again here, um, the, the angle is positively changing from x to y, so that means that our angle vector will have to be along the z direction in this direction. So in this case, I'm just gonna write that theta is perpendicular to the plane of rotation and such that the right hand rule um, has uh, your thumb pointing along theta for positive angles, right? So a quick question about that then, um, what, what is the direction of this, this theta um, vector uh, and, and um, what's the direction of the theta vector for um, a clock face? So for a clock face where, of course, the, um, you know, naturally the, the, the angle is positive in, um, in, uh, in the clockwise direction. Um, so for a clock face, in which direction will this, uh, this uh, vector theta point in? Will it be, so it has to be perpendicular to the plane of rotation. So it has to be perpendicular to the, the clock face, the plane of the clock face itself. But then the question is, is it pointing into the clock face or out of the clock face? And so um, use your right hand, um, put your, your fingers along the direction in which the, um, the angle is changing in the clock face. 
and then your thumb will point in the direction of, uh, of the vector theta. And so you'll see that it actually is pointing into the clock, right? So if we have a clock face, the positive angles are in this direction. If I put my, uh, my fingers along this direction, then I will end up with um, a vector that is pointing into the page. So that is going to be my vector theta for a particular um, angle theta that is positive here. Um, okay, so this is angular position, a little bit more detail than what we've talked about. Um, yeah, so clocks go in this direction. Um, I know this is, this is starting to be uh, to rapidly becoming an obsolete um, example uh, because obviously uh, some of you might have thought a clock face, a clock face, how are their angles on a digital clock face? Um, but we are indeed talking about an analog clock face here. Um, so this was angular position, or in other words, just angle, um, but I'm calling it angular position here to make it uh, similar to, um, to position in, uh, in linear um, translation problems. So from the angular position, we can get to now angular velocity. So that's now how rapidly is this angle changing? What's the rate of change of this um, of of the of the angle of the object that is moving um, along that circular trajectory? And so, of course, the angular velocity omega, which we've also introduced already, is the derivative of the angle theta with time, um, and of course, in this case, the units will be radians per second. Again, the same thing is true here for the direction in which this is pointing um, in uh, uh, a clock face. Again, let's stay with the same example. Omega is constant um, and it is positive in the direction in which the angles are, are changing. So the angle is always increasing. And so in that case, again, Omega will be pointing in the direction of um, the uh, into the into the clock phase. Um, if we go back to uh, our expression here that uh, theta is s over r, that means that s is um, r times theta. S is r times theta. So we can actually connect that to our tangential velocity, which is a linear velocity. A linear velocity in the sense that it's not an angular velocity like omega, but it's an it's a velocity that corresponds to things. Um, uh, it's the kind of velocity that we've talked about in the past, where uh, um, we we just have uh, uh, meters per second and so on. So that tangential velocity is ds dt. So in this case, that will be if we plug in s um, the expression for s that will be uh, r d theta dt plus theta dr dt and for constant radius that will of course become r times d theta dt or r times omega again something that we've already uh, talked about in the past so when we have a constant r then the tangential velocity is equal to r times omega um, in terms of uh, um, it, in terms of the um, the angular velocity again we can write this in terms of a, a vector expression so in this case we'll take S is theta cross R, we'll take the derivative, S is theta cross R, take the derivative d dt, and we'll find that the velocity, which really is the tangential velocity, but I won't always write that t, um, is omega cross R. So that's the vector expression to get from the vector quantity for angular velocity and the position to a velocity. Again, tangential velocity, since it's the outcome of this vector product, will be perpendicular to um, omega and to, uh, um, to the position vector. That's, um, let's see, I don't think I have that picture, no. Um, but essentially it's, uh, 
It's what you would get here if you replace theta with an omega vector and you replaced um, s with the velocity vector. So the velocity will be um, along the tangential direction and the um, uh, and omega will be along the, the z direction. Okay, um, if we have uh, a spinning disk like this, um, in, uh, in this case, you know, we have a, a tangential velocity V1 for a distance R1, for this, the tangential velocity V2 for a distance R2. Um, since this tangential velocity is equal to, uh, um, to R times omega, and omega is constant if both of those points are fixed to the same disk, then of course the tangential velocity at larger um, radii is, is, is going to be larger than the tangential velocity at smaller radii. Okay. Um, so then finally, now that we have uh, angular position and angular velocity, now we're going to go to um, angular acceleration. So angular acceleration, that's going to be alpha is d omega dt, and that's going to be then d2 theta dt squared, so the second derivative. Um, and the units of alpha are going to be radians per second squared. Um, again, if uh, we can write this as a, as a vector expression starting from this one now, um, we're going to have the tangential acceleration is alpha cross r. Um, so tangential acceleration. This was our uh, um, tangential velocity. Um, and of course, the same things are true about uh, the direction. If, if alpha is positive, then omega grows, um, or the same thing is true for the, the direction of alpha. Uh, it will be perpendicular to, um, uh, to uh, the, um, the plane in which the rotation is happening. Um, and it will, of course, be positive in the positive z direction if omega increases in that same direction. Um, so, so those are all things to keep in mind um, when, uh, when solving problems that we, we pick the right sign, right? Okay, so um, some of you are pointing out in the chat, yes, we've already covered some of this. Um, I do wanna repeat this because of uh, the next part. So just so we have um, uh, the, the acceleration, the velocity, and the angular position um, fresh in our minds, because now we're going to go over uh, a fairly um, a fairly important set of uh, of formulas, which um, I'm not going to go into in detail because they're essentially exactly the same as what we did in lin linear motion. So we're going to do angular motion, and we're going to compare it with what we had for linear motion. And in this case, we're going to do this for kinematics. So this is kinematics, no forces, just um, things that are moving, uh, and we're going to describe the, uh, the motion. Um, and this is for constant acceleration. So, oops. So what we had in the case of, uh, of linear motion is we could write for a velocity that changes between an initial time and a final time, oops, we could write that the average velocity is the initial velocity plus the final velocity over two, right? Um, no big deal, that's, uh, um, uh, that's the average velocity. So here, in angular motion, we'll have the same formula. The average angular velocity is the initial angular velocity plus the final angular, angular velocity over two. Um, and 
we actually wrote this here also as, as um, delta um, delta x over delta t. So um, the finite displacement over the finite time that we are uh, um, seeing that displacement over. So here we're going to have delta theta over delta t. With that average velocity, we could write that x is Apparently, I'm accidentally pressing the, the, the scroll bar here. Um, so that's x is x0 plus the average velocity times delta t, right? That, that follows directly from there. Um, so that will be true for angular velocity and angular motion as well. So theta will be theta0 plus omega average times delta t. Again, that comes from this expression. If we want to introduce now the acceleration, then the final velocity is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times delta t. And here in this case, for angular motion, we have omega final is omega initial plus angular acceleration times delta t. Um, note that here we could introduce or, um, or, or tangential linear velocity to kind of connect those two pictures. So this is our um, angular velocity, which we can connect with or tangential linear velocity using the expression that r times omega is equal to or tangential velocity or r um or uh, r cross omega um or rather uh, i guess i should have written it the other way around but uh, um omega cross r is the tangential velocity so that's what we have for uh for tangential velocity of course there's another formula for linear motion that we use, and that is that uh, um, x is x0 plus v0 delta t plus 1 half a delta t squared. So that's, of course, going to have an equivalent in angular motion as well. That's now going to be theta is theta 0 plus v, well, v is omega, so that's omega 0 delta t plus 1 half alpha delta t squared. Um, there's another expression that we derived earlier. That's v squared final is v squared initial plus 2a x minus x initial. So again, same thing is true for angular motion. Omega final squared is omega 0 squared omega initial squared plus 2 times alpha theta minus theta zero. All of these formulas from linear motion have their equivalent in angular motion when we're working in the case of uh, constant acceleration and we're looking just at kinematics. So there's a lot of similarities between um, those, two, uh, those two pictures um, between angular and, um, and linear motion. So here we're introducing now the angular acceleration and that is going to be related to our tangential linear acceleration similarly to this expression here and this expression so omega or excuse me alpha cross r is now the tangential acceleration that's the acceleration along the, the tangential direction. So remember that this is, um, this is zero for uniform circular motion. Uh, uniform circular motion, which we covered before. Um, but for non-uniform circular motion, there will be a tangential 
linear acceleration that corresponds to the um, angular acceleration or the um, increase in the rate or decrease in the rate of um, of angular um, of, of angular change so an increase or a decrease in the angular velocity and of course we can also write this as a scalar quantity r times al alpha is equal to a t so that's our tangential linear acceleration we also know there's a centripetal linear acceleration the centripetal linear acceleration which kind of now connects the angular motion with the um, uh, with you know has both a the, the acceleration the linear acceleration has both a tangential and a centripetal um, component so that's a c and a c i'm not going to write this as a as a vector because we know it points to the center of the motion um, and it's equal to the tangential velocity divided by the um, the radius of the um, of the motion and so there will be a vector quantity to this um, let me just write this as minus r hat um, minus this r hat so it's in the radial direction pointing towards the center of motion so that gives us our total acceleration um, a is equal to a t plus a centripetal okay so just to go through this again angular motion is very similar to linear motion all of our formulas that we had in the case of uh, of linear motion for kinematics they just translate in their exact equivalent for angular motion um, where we have linear acceleration we end up with um, angular acceleration where we had linear velocity we end up with um, angular velocity there's one other thing which is the centripetal linear acceleration um, uh, because the connections um, here are most direct when we go to tangential linear acceleration but there's also the centripetal linear acceleration which causes the object of course to move um, on a circular trajectory by changing the direction in which the, um, the, the object is moving. So all of this was for um, constant acceleration in particular you know these formulas are true for constant acceleration um, if we go to uh, non-constant acceleration, then of course we have to treat this using calculus. So for non-constant acceleration, non-constant acceleration, then of course we'll have that uh, in this case v is dx dt, um, a is dv dt, and these are vector expressions even uh, and d2x dt squared so in our case this will now become that omega is d theta dt and alpha is d omega dt or d2 theta dt squared so all of these are now you know theta as a function of time omega as a function of time alpha as a function of time just like um, v was a function of time x was a function of time and a was a function of time so all of that is similar as well here okay so this is important to keep in mind that uh, any kind of problem in kinematics with angular um, uh, angular motion is is essentially identical to um, to a problem in linear motion except we're now replacing positions and displacements with uh, um, with angular with angles and we're replacing the linear um, velocity and acceleration with angular velocity and acceleration okay let me see there probably were some slides that I skipped here in the meantime um, so, so here just a reminder of the, the fact that we have l circular um, uh, motion that has both a, a, a tangential acceleration 
and a centripetal acceleration in the case of the uniform circular motion when the velocity does not change or the speed does not change only the the direction changes then we only have centripetal acceleration if the speed increases if the tangential velocity increases in magnitude then we will have a uh, tangential acceleration that is along the, the of course the tangential direction but in the forward direction yeah i'm glad that uh, um, we had a, a month for everyone to catch up on the on the calculus so i can actually say things that uh, that happily make sense so uh okay um okay and that's the next part um so so that essentially covers um the kinematics of angular motion um, we could do some uh, some problems but uh, but we're going to keep that for uh, for next week in uh, homework assignment um so we could do some problems on that and it would be essentially the same thing you know start with from a, a zero acceleration um how long does it take to spin up a flywheel how long does it does it take to uh, or, or what acceleration do you need for um you know what is it what is the angular velocity of the of the minute hand on on a clock um what's the relative angular velocity of the second hand with respect to the minute hand and so on um there's all kinds of problems that we can uh, um we we can write down that are essentially the same as what we did in linear motion so let's now go to the thing that is fairly different and that is the kinetic energy so if we go now to kinetic energy i'm still going to keep the comparison here between linear motion and angular motion but it's going to look pretty soon it's going to look um, look different so in linear motion as a reminder um, the uh, kinetic energy k is one half m v squared right that's the the mass of the object that is moving um, and v is the linear velocity of that object um, and similarly, we had that K for a, a collection of objects was the sum over I of one half M I V I squared, right? That's the, the velocity, the kinetic energy um, of a collection of objects that are moving. So now if we start from this first expression for a single object, and we look at this for uh, uh, an object that is moving in, in angular motion, that means that the uh, Velocity v really is the tangential velocity is r times omega, right? So if we use that expression, then we can see that the kinetic energy in angular motion for a single object moving along a circular trajectory will have to be one half m, and then we have our v squared, so that's r omega squared so that's one half m r squared times omega squared i'm gonna write it this way why am i writing it this way because that puts my linear velocity and my angular velocity on the same footing they're both here so this is my um, angular velocity of the object, just like this with the linear velocity. And here we have the mass, but the mass has been, has been replaced by something else. The mass has been replaced by mass times r squared. Um, this mass of the object in the kinetic energy, that's the thing that gives the object inertia. So this m r squared is going to be the moment of inertia of um, this object and so essentially the moment of inertia takes the role of the mass of the object in linear motion um, it is the thing that if it's bigger 
um, the same angular velocity will give it a bigger amount of kinetic energy. Just like um, a, a heavy truck with a high mass um, will have a higher kinetic energy at the same linear velocity um, compared to a small car. So, um, how does that go if we now have uh, multiple objects? So if we have multiple objects, then we'll end up taking the sum now. So the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy will be the sum of all of the kinetic energies of one half m i r i squared omega i squared. And if all of the objects are actually fixed and it's just a single object, they're moving at the same rotational velocity, at the same angular velocity omega, if omega i for all i is equal to omega, then we'll find that this is one half, we'll have the sum of m i r i squared omega squared. Again, we have something that has a moment of inertia here a single quantity that we can calculate and that we just have to multiply with the square of the angular velocity and divide by two to get to the kinetic energy. This is what we're going to now write as one half i omega squared where i is the moment of inertia. And so k is one half i omega just like K in linear motion was one half mass v squared, right? So, um, so this was the the measure of inertia for linear motion, and of course, the moment of inertia is a measure of inertia for circular motion or for angular motion. Now it's a little bit more difficult to calculate uh, um, it's a little bit more, more difficult to calculate I because you can see it's a sum over things here um, and obviously when we have uh, um, a distributed uh, a continuously distributed um, distribution of mass, then it won't even be a sum, it will be a, um, it'll be an integral. So it becomes a little bit more difficult than just saying, oh, this is the mass. Um, but in some sense, the mass is also um, an integral, right? It's an integral of the density over the volume of the object. So the uh, moment of inertia is going to be an integral over the density, over the volume of the object, but with this r squared in it. So what does the r squared dependence do? Um, it makes the, the mass that is further away from the center, where r squared is bigger, it makes it more important. So um, the r squared dependence in i makes the masses further away from the, the axis of rotation more important. So that means that uh, if we have, um, you know, if we have all of the mass close to the center of rotation, the moment of inertia will be small. If we take that same mass and distribute it further away from the center of rotation, we'll have um, a larger, uh, we'll have a larger uh, moment of inertia. Um, this is essentially what a, a, an ice skater, a figure skater does um, when they, uh, they, they pull themselves very close to the, their axis of rotation or when they stick out their arms. If their arms are, are uh, stretched out, then this R squared dependence gives them a much larger I. And so if we maintain the same kinetic energy, it means that omega will have to decrease. So if you stick out your arms, you're going to decrease your uh, your angular velocity. Um, if you are uh, pulling your your arms close to your um, to your chest, then uh, you'll be uh, um, increasing your angular velocity. Okay. Um, 
So one more thing that I didn't mention, the moment of inertia here has units, of course, that are mass times position squared. So that's going to be kilogram times meter squared. So that will be the units of uh, the, the moment of inertia. And you'll see this typically written um, even for distributed objects as um, explicitly the mass times um, a characteristic size of the object with then whatever factors are needed um, to make it mathematically correct. But that's something we'll, uh, we'll go into um, on Friday for a couple of common objects. Okay, that's it for today. Um, so glad to all, uh, glad to be back and then to see you all here again. Um, and we will pick up with this on uh, Friday. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'll be hanging out here a little bit if you're, um, you know, concerned about how this, uh, this all will uh, continue for the rest of the term and then into uh, January.